welcome to the soft matter show this is amal narayana i am a chemist and a polymer scientist in this podcast we will talk about soft matter science and have fireside chats with the researchers please enjoy the show hello soft matter people welcome to another episode of the soft matter show our today's guest is dr saad bamla saad is a professor at the school of chemical and biomolecular engineering at the georgia institute of technology in this episode saad talked about some of the organisms that possess unique biophysical mechanisms for sustaining their life these organisms include slingshot spiders Californian worms and much more. You may even find parts of this conversation about how insects pee. Yes, you are hearing me right. Sad also took time to chat about how one can contribute to improve lives in countries with minimal resources using frugal science. You can read more about Sad's endeavor in the show notes. at the softmattershow.com thank you today we have dr saad bamla here at the soft matter show saad is a professor at the school of chemical and biomolecular engineering at the georgia institute of technology saad is an expert in organismic biophysics and biological soft matter he is also known for developing cost effective solutions to resolve some of the outstanding challenges in global health. Saad is also a National Geographic Explorer and a recipient of NSF Career Award. With that, let's hear from Saad. Welcome to the Soft Matter Show. Thank you so much, Amal. I'm happy to be here. So let me ask about this National Geographic Explorer part. Because you, I mean, I'm assuming that you have traveled all around the world uh, as a part of this. So what are some of the places that you have liked the most while traveling? So the way the National Geographic Award well in my case worked and what it enabled us to do is I had this uh, uh this obsession in our scientific curiosity to understand uh, these organisms these spiders called slingshot spiders colloquially these are teridiosomatids um and the wonderful thing about them is that unlike traditional spiders that make flat webs and wait for insects to you know fly into them as a trap these webs uh, take a little bit more active role in hunting and they make a triangular or a conical three dimensional web with a sling line and like their name suggests slingshotting themselves to catch flying insect in mid air and there are lots of biomechanics material science and sensing uh questions that i had and i wanted to study this but the challenge is that this organism lives deep in the middle of really isolated rainforests uh in peru um and so to be able to study this uh, unlike uh some scientists whom we might be lucky to bring our organisms in a test tube and petri dishes and study them uh in the comfort of our labs that in uh, atlanta or whatever part of the us is here we have to go where the organism lives and to study this and so i pitched it to national geographic to uh to kind of execute and uh, go on this expedition bringing the lab to the forest and not vice versa and that's essentially what that enabled uh, us to do is to go to the amazonian rainforest which is kind of like a dream uh bring uh mecha- measurement tools imaging tools take our students there uh, bring along local students local peruvian students as well to show them what's in their backyard and how we may uncover kind of these extreme uh, extraordinary animals uh, that live there uh, and we've kind of written up two papers so Uh, that's we are actually planning to go to the field again in 2 months now that we can travel with covid but that's what kind of these kind of fellowships enable us to do is to travel to these deep uh, resource limited and inaccessible places to study these creatures so is the slingshot spider is it only found in peru or is it uh, if, is is it like common in tropical weather um 
So the specific uh, uh, spiders we were looking for uh, are only in the Peruvian, Amazonian rainforest. But here's the thing with things that nobody else studies or we know very little about what exists and uh, what is uh, there is that we just don't know because in this, uh, there's a funny anecdote. So these are nocturnal spiders and it's a one millimeter spider. So it's a tiny dot. Oh, and wow. when my postdoc Simone and I were there, I told her, well, the challenge is very simple in the middle of the night. So we start our work when everybody else goes to sleep. So we start going out at about 10 PM or 11 PM and then are up until five is that in the dark rainforest and for hundreds and hundreds of miles, there's nobody else. It's just forest and just the sky above is we're going to find, look for a tiny black dot in a dark rainforest. And so I said, it's literally looking for a needle in a haystack where everything is all dark and the needle is also black. Uh, so, um, yeah, that is the kind of uh, challenge. And I think um, it's a, not a model organism or anything like that. So it's very hard to know where it exists. But there are reports back uh, that it has been found in uh, forests of Mexico and Costa Rica and some of these areas. But I wouldn't be surprised um, if it is there in other places. But yeah, I so don't know. But to be honest, I don't know the answer. <laughs> are these poisonous by any chance? No, do they these bite are... You? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, they're launching uh, at, at you at really high accelerations and G-forces. And if they were to bite, they would make them a very deadly enemy. Uh, but uh, fortunately, that, uh, fortunately, they're quite harmless. These mm. are tiny, tiny spiders that are not venomous or anything like that. And they're actually cute. Uh, in fact, you might be able to squint and see a picture of them on my wall. Oh, I, see. Um, I think I've yeah, seen one, it from one someone's pa paper. Yeah, I think I see. Yeah, that. one might describe them as very cute, cuddly, uh, <laughs> hairy things. <laughs> so, let's talk about the the science of the slingshot. So, what are some of the unique things that you found from slingshot spiders, which is not commonly seen in other type of spiders? So there are there are multiple layers of questions, but beyond just fast moving spiders as a, as a lab we are fascinated by understanding how some organisms can really move and achieve high accelerations talking about millions of accelerations or g forces in meters per second square to do these to do kind of these extreme movements you have to ask kind of how these organisms are leveraging materials to bypass the limits of muscles right because that's kind of where they are the spider is kind of a very good example because it's actually the only non-primate uh, system which is actually constructing a spring using its web to uh, you like think of it as a tool. So it's secreting and constructing and fabricating this exotic spring in three-dimensional space and it's really sophisticated. It's not just like a rubber band or as a child, if you might be playing with uh, a simple slingshot, this is a three-dimensional structure. It constructs, finds places to stick its web, launches, tests, tests the tension, and then waits. And then it has to sense and accurately aim, because this is an energetically very high intense process in the dark uh, at a prey, which is within its range and it's flying at really high speeds like a mosquito or a wasp or a fly and then catch it and if it fails and it has to reset and not just you know flail about and so that you can start to see the more you think about it there's a lot of layers of complexity and so the silk is not like normal silk uh, there's a lot of elasticity in these things in fact from a power density and energy density perspective if you think about batteries, uh, for example, is what you would think. You want something that charges and discharges quickly, but also has enough juice in it. These spiders use these topologically structured uh, webs to actually load a lot of energy that gives them a lot of power very, very quickly. Um, and they use these sling lines as uh, the ability to store enough tension in them in these high humid conditions. Um, and to be able to release this very quickly without any dissipation is, again, a very interesting task. How they're sensing, because everything is happening within 50 milliseconds, to be able to detect and do this where in low light conditions where vision may not be your only uh, source is there's a lot of things happening in a very short period of time. So um, for me, as I look at this, this is a really complex puzzle to start to uh, tease apart what's happening. Does that kind of give you a picture of what we're dealing with? 
so one thing i learned is that it has that that three dimensional spring which helps it to <clears throat> sorry to helps it to shoot the web in the dark right so is there a glue that is attached with it like i am like i'm always intrigued by the adhesives which are which are observed in uh, you know spiders because i know for my my colleagues ali and uh, todd blackledge they have tried to understand the adhesive behavior of these threads so what what are your thoughts on that like how how does it is it like a do you think the capture is not about adhesion or is it about like the way the web is formed so it's interesting you mention uh, Todd Blackledge because the recent paper a few months ago in January uh, we just published on the mathematical modeling of the um, both the high energy release but also the dissipation of the energy because it's not just sometimes enough to launch quickly but it's important to be able to stop that movement quickly without self inflected damage but also to the web so that you can relaunch and reset right if you imagine a spacex falcon heavy the whole challenge is not to just bombard rockets out of space but to be able to relaunch them so you reuse this so think of these spiders which take them hours and hours to build this web but you don't want to dissipate and waste all this energy so you have to be very careful to have safety breaks in them to be able to and so we wrote up this mathematical model with Todd Blackledge uh, as one of the co-authors and a student and going back to the answer of the glue I, the short answer is we don't know mm-hmm. um but uh, it is are some sem images reveal that the sticky lines actually uh would enable and enhance kind of how the uh, flying insects stick um to the webs so that the sticky lines kind of uh provide that uh the adhesion to mm-hmm. these insects but um, yeah i'm aware of some of the literature on the you know some kind of lizard which can like it has a it has some kind of viscoelastic material on its tongue because of that slingshot or the velocity it more behaves like a liquid at higher velocity and it's it helps it to stick and when it captures back in a slower velocity it becomes more like a solid and sticks it better but yeah it's some something to think about so what are some of the other organisms that you guys are working with right now so um the other organism that uh, well there are maybe five or six we could talk about that are still uh, cooking on slow burners and mm-hmm. unpublished yet but another one that we recently uh, published a paper on uh, earlier this year i want to say is worm blobs and here we're kind of asking the question if you think about uh, from a soft matter perspective um here you have these worms which are living in shallow uh pond uh, areas where i found them they can aggregate you know hundreds of uh, thousands of worms can aggregate with their slender polymer like bodies into a ball that can do interesting things so think of it as a uh, ball of spaghetti that you might eat except that it's alive and can change its shape and crawl and uh, roll and kind of do interesting things and the kind of questions we want to understand like you said about the example for the lizard is how do you encode in a living uh soft material mechanical uh rheological properties that facilitate or enable emergent behavior in this case could you have this living ball of spaghetti crawl across the floor and how is it leveraging kind of the active the non uh non uh, equilibrium properties as well as liquid uh, sol gel transitions etc as well as polymer dynamics so those are kind of questions we're exploring so what kind of worm is this just out of curiosity this is a lumbricus variegatus is its scientific name it's known as a mud worm uh these are uh, really uh, they look red and brown and about uh, 1 mm in diameter so very very fine and a few centi- tens of centimeters in long so very uh, long worms um they are known as semi aquatic worms mm-hmm. and essentially think of them as scavengers and decomposers in pond area so they'll eat all kinds of decaying matter um like leaves or bacteria and they live in these shallow areas uh, a peculiar thing about them if you ever observe them in their natural habitat is they stick their heads in the sand and they stick their tails out uh and the biological reason for why they do that is because they breathe through their tails so that the tails are basically hanging out up in the air and they can breathe through their uh tails 
while they basically hang out in this shallow boundary layer of moving fluid with their heads uh, holding on so they don't get blown away. <laughs> That's fun. That should be something <laughs> to watch, I guess. So, so when you work on them, you, do you bring the the worms to the lab or do you go to the lab, their habitat and work on it? Yeah, so we have now a, a small uh, zoo in the lab. We have these cultures of these organisms. And uh, as a bioengineer and biophysicist to be able to work on these organisms, like I mentioned for the spider, we can't keep the spiders or bring the spiders here from Peru. So like this year, in two months, we're going to go back to the field. Um, but for some of these organisms that are accessible and available in our backyards and in the U.S., we spent quite a lot of time trying to figure out and create conditions where we can culture them in the lab. So if you ever come to our lab, I'll show you kind <laughs> of uh, how we learned how to keep them happy and get them to reproduce and culture them to re for two reasons. One, of course, it's easy now to have access to these systems. Or a second is the more we understand by culturing them and keeping them happy, and their ecosystem, we learn a little bit about what their perhaps semi-natural conditions might be where we can change essentially the temperature, acidity, uh, light conditions, and learn a little bit about what they like to live in and gives us a little bit more context when we recreate some of these situations. So let me ask you about the real-life implications. So there are people who work on bio-inspired systems and you learn a lot of fundamental aspects of how organisms work and the how metabolism or or how the how their collective work helps them for surviving so what are some of the things that we can learn which would which can be which will have a real life implications from these organisms so specifically for the worm blob my vision is this so have you seen stranger things on netflix i uh, know i have not <laughs> Well, okay, you should definitely, you know, Amazing. after this podcast go <laughs> and you have some homework is to watch <laughs> Stranger Things. Um, but, you know, sometimes science fiction writers can imagine things that uh, we haven't seen. And classically, it's the stuff of nightmares or stuff of science fiction where you ha <clears throat> may have this amorphous, uh, and typically these are things that chase you and kill you, right? These are never the protagonists. They're the antagonists. It's a blob, a shape-shifting, living, uh, you know, uh, uh, nightmarish creature uh, that they portray as something that can, you know, change its shape, crawl under doors, and, you know, really uh, have on demand, can achieve tasks and take kill things, etc. And when I look at this as a soft matter scientist, if I may, I think, what a cool idea, and why can't we build something like this, perhaps for good? Because imagine now a, a dream that I have that I would like to get to perhaps in 10, if not 20 years, is how do we make a blob? A blob a essentially a soft material that can change its shape on demand to give emergent properties that can do things. And it might be useful, for example, in the oceans, if it needs to swim, or if it comes on the beach or on the land, it can change its shape. And you don't have to worry about the terrain or the rocks or the tides uh, or intertidal zones or within even our house, why does it need to be made out of rigid parts? And so that's the vision. But how do we build a blob? The problem is that the physics of these things and the material science of these things and the programming because you cannot sit and program each aspect this is a non-trivial problem it's not clear and i think that's why it's still the realm of science fiction so how do we bring this through is something that keeps us awake at night and that's why we study for example these worm blobs because sometimes biology has tinkered over millions of years and reveals a fascinating example of a blob that can do these things so number one having a model system like this that we can play and poke and study carefully in the lab reveals the rules of collective entangled matter or blobs and that's number one and then number two we can start to build as we are trying to do in the lab build mathematical physical models but also robotics so in our recent paper we show that already we can leverage some simple robotics that can serve as a test bed to test these ideas of how we would build a blob as a future robotic thing because it's a slightly different vision from what we might think about robots not like the classical boston dogs one big giant robot but what if it was all made of tiny components that came together did things and shift shape shifted so you're trying to inspire robotic designs 
from the biological matter the way it does so it's it's easier than uh, i mean uh, done but what are what do you think are the challenges in terms of uh, trying to do a biomimicry to create bio inspired or robotics so just to clarify i'm not trying to do the bio inspired robotics i think perhaps that's uh two or three more steps down i think the first step is we need to understand kind of the rules that it, the physics that operates for these kind of emergent behaviors and mm-hmm. i think we are not even at the you know, our classical approaches of i can't the way you think about this from you know uh i can't just expect to model one of them and then scale it up to 100,000 a million a billion and expect them to collectively give me the same response as one the physics changes it's no longer the same rules and we are just starting to piece together some of those rules that perhaps illuminate how we might think about control systems of decentralized algorithms and how we might even start to ask the questions it's kind of an unknown unknown we actually don't know and that's why i started by saying these are the stuff of science fiction it's easier mm-hmm. to kind of think of these as black boxes but how do you even start to approach them and that's the first step we're doing is looking at the organisms starting to break this down a bit more yeah well that 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 says that there are a lot of open questions <laughs> in this field which which i i'm i'm assuming that future scientists also can contribute to and become more open to this kind of science so one of the things i wanted to ask you is that okay we were talking about biophysics and organismic organismic physics and i was wondering you are in a chemical engineering school right so <laughs> how, i know where you're going with this <laughs> how do you <laughs> how do you like convince uh, the students or like are your colleagues and how do you hire students who works who wants to work who was from a chemical engineering background how do they train themselves to work in a biological active matter so it's it's a uh, well i'll say there's a good part and a bad part the good part is that uh, you know when we study these systems and some are more whimsical than the others like the worm blobs and slingshot spiders and we study how insects pee some of these are so <laughs> easy to attract so in the question pee? Yeah, oh, we wow. should talk about that in a second. <laughs> uh, and the the point is most of the PhD students and the postdoctoral students get attracted who want to reach out and work with this. Um as scientists and as humans we are always all in innately curious and we want to do things that excite us and sometimes although we may laugh at the idea initially the more we think about it we realize wait a second there's actually serious science in this stuff. This is actually non trivial. and those are always the best hooks to think about it and realize that there is you know it's it's all just because at first glance it may seem trivial the more you think about it you realize it's actually really complex but fascinating and interesting and somehow the students get uh, once they appreciate it they realize that the tools and training that they have whether they are biophysicists soft matter scientists chemical engineers we are all trained with very critical skills of quantitative approaches and all of these problems uh, are amenable to this those same tool sets you just have to be a little bit open minded and ap- applying them um another way to look at this is biology doesn't know uh, or nature doesn't know biology or chemistry or math or you know engineering it does what it does as humans as scientists we are looking at those systems through our lens of the world and trying to put this part together and that part together just to kind of compile what we think it's doing but nature does what it does so we are all bringing our own perspectives um so i think it works so far very well in the lab because mm-hmm. at least uh, every student uh, so far in the lab feels that they have ownership of their project and each of these questions makes them feel they are really asking something that uh, is interesting to them and keeps them awake and you know is a very complex tangible problem that uh keeps them excited about it and i think sometimes that's important you have to have a little bit of fun and you have to be excited about what you are studying um and it just takes a, almost a, all of us can do it we just have to have a little bit of courage and a nudge and i think uh, most people i find will gladly take to these problems um if given the chance yeah that brings to me to my question on how does insects be <laughs> oh. I cannot leave you with that that such a curious thing. So 
the whole thing started a few years ago when I observed uh, uh, in my backyard that I could feel raindrops near my uh, a bunch of my plants. But as I stepped outside their shadow, it wasn't raining. I was trying to figure out where these droplets of water was coming from. And as I peered closely, I realized that there were these tiny leafhopper insects that were actually peeing. So I took my <laughs> iPhone, made some videos. And at first glance, it didn't seem that interesting, right? An insect pee. But slowly, as I looked a little bit carefully and looked at the data, and this is where I, you know, just some analysis with the high-speed camera revealed some very interesting features that they were not being in jets like I would naively expect and think that everybody should be in a jet as mammals would. Um, but they were being in a droplet fashion. And as soon as I saw wow. that droplet, I was like, why pee in droplet as a discrete system? That's already so complex and weird, right? And so a little bit of analysis, and uh, I was able to recruit a really talented student, uh, Elio. That's how this full PhD now is to think about peeing and spitting insects. Um, and over the couple of years, we've discovered so many interesting puzzles. That's a paper we're writing that they're actually doing super propulsion is what we're calling it, is they're leveraging the surface tension of these droplets as springs to catapult them and use that as elastic reservoirs of energy to ballistically transfer this material. So it's a very interesting concept of a biological pump because mm -hmm. think of these insects as a mosquito that for plants. So mosquitoes suck our blood and these insects are sucking plant sap and they have to get rid of this very, very quickly. And they have to exploit some interesting fluid dynamics and surface tension properties that lead to a whole set of puzzles that we did not think it would be so interesting and turns out that scientists for decades if not for centuries have really been obsessed with how insects drink mm -hmm. because think about mosquitoes think about uh nectar you know uh, pollen pollen and how uh, bees etc might drink fluids uh but rarely has somebody thought about the other business end of insects and i i am a big believer that it's equally important because everything is a uh, open system what yeah. needs to go in has to go out and so it's very important in any yeah, case it's that sounds really fun actually like i mean even though like it's a funny idea but it, it seems like a lot of science goes behind even for simple processes or as peeing of the insects but it's not as simple as it looks like but yeah i'm i'm, I'm all the best for that with that end of year <laughs> so i'm looking forward to that paper as well and uh, so when you hire students when you hire phds or postdocs in your lab what do you look for in them like what, what is the criteria that that helps you recruit them number one is curiosity mm -hmm. if somebody isn't curious about the natural world around them i think uh, it's already uh, very difficult to engage and uh, i would say that Almost if I were able to hire, I'd hire very, very early uh, uh, early stages, like even before people go through high school, because yeah. I find children to be the most curious. Somehow our education system forces people to uh, forget kind of the natural uh, beauty of the world and how there are so many interesting problems right in front of our eyes. Um, and so that's one thing that is very important is to, when we talk to people, when I'm at least looking for bringing in people in the group, um, is to see if they want to have some fun and look at things in a slightly different way and be open. But the second part of that is equally important is that sometimes uh, bringing people into the lab, you need to have kind people who are open-minded and won't laugh at everybody in the lab because most of the ideas are at first glance crazy, right? So you have to have a little bit more patience and not laugh at your colleagues while they explore uh, why certain insect is spitting this way or doing so, such acrobatics and be patient and, and encourage and we enable each other through the crazy till we get to the thing that makes more sense. And so I think it takes a certain individual to thrive in this atmosphere and be open-minded enough to go down this unusual uh, whimsical path and be able to find kind of these amazing things in, at first glance, which would look like very silly. So, yeah, that sounds uh, very challenging to things to do as well. Like, you know, to, I mean, many of the students who come for are like, you know, want to go to a industry job or when you, then when it comes to a very curious, pro open ended problem, it becomes more 
harder for them to convince themselves to come in. But definitely, like if you find the people who are curious enough to do or natural problems, that would be very interesting. Very, very, very hard to find. But yes. It will be very interesting. But once you find them, yeah. I'll tell you that I cannot express to you. It makes me thankful of my job every day because it's such a delight to be able to come into the lab and uh, we all brainstorm together and have these aha moments and be like, oh my goodness, the, we are the first people in the world to know it. And we think it's so darn cool. And I think that's such a joy to be able to see students fall in love and do it because then we're not trying to chase phd thesis deadlines and try to chase papers or whatever it is that we figure out there's a joy to do science and this discovery and it is such a special thing because mm-hmm. life is short and mm-hmm. covid has taught us that what our priorities of life is and sometimes we all do science but we forget why we do it and whether we want to get a paper whatever it is and it's these small joys in life that make it so meaningful um, so i don't know when it clicks it's so beautiful i agree it's magic. i agree i i can under- completely understand that feeling as well when you see things which you would think it won't work and it works that's like the best thing ever <laughs> <laughs> and reproducibility as well so, <laughs> so let me next uh, shuffle back to a very different part of your career so let me ask about frugal science so it's it has a lot of i think reach these days the the term frugal science but many people does not understand what it means so can you for us define what is frugal science yeah so one of the missions that our lab and other labs across the world we're realizing is that we're very fortunate to be able to do science and also beyond science we're very fortunate in different parts of the world to have access to medical technologies whether it's a N95 mask or a respirator or a vaccine and the way society is today in 2021 the pandemic has really opened this gap between the haves and the have not and the two of us at least talking here classifying the haves but we both uh, uh, may know at least first hand if not second hand through our colleagues and friends and family uh other people who may be still suffering while we're trying to go back to business to normal and that's kind of this uh, empathetic view that we think about the world and as engineers would like to address some of these things and that's where frugal science really comes from is trying to recognize that not all technology and hardware needs to be expensive we don't all need to adopt a iphone model of the world where everything needs to be a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars and every year need to buy a new one how do we do low tech stuff without compromising on the quality whether it's microscopes or centrifuges or hearing aids or vaccine delivery devices everything is costly but not necessarily because of its inherent cost but the way society builds value around them so we're basically designing engineering and developing and perhaps oftentimes inventing new tools to kind of democratize if you will this access to scientific and or biomedical hardware yeah so the democratization of science and the in the technologies derived from the science is is actually a very important thing in the in the culture right now so, i mean we can learn from our covid and other i mean i'm also coming from a place where there's not the vaccine is not very available as as here like it, recently i saw an, a board in the walk street that anyone who comes with a, anyone can come in and just take the vaccine so that such luxury is not available in many places around the world right now that itself asks for a question of affordability of things so what are some of the important or like one of the ground breaking things that happened through the frugal science some of the devices if you may so i'll tell you about one which is a very crazy journey and i'm very proud of it we haven't published it but hopefully we'll submit the manuscript in a couple of weeks but i think it'll be a one of my most recent uh, things that i'm very proud of and this whole thing started from a uh, let me try to say it this way so you understand the need and how we try to address this need because in the first part of my life with organisms there's no problem i'm trying to solve mm-hmm. i'm just trying to understand nature in this part of the world we may start often times from the problem and then try to engineer things and you said the vaccine and you walking and seeing a boardwalk that you could walk in and get a vaccine and inherent is the logistics of cold chain because you know these mrna vaccines whether you got a covid uh, moderna or a pfizer these need to be stored at least at freezer if not minus 80 degrees which is 
amongst the other logistic and production issues are a huge issue with bringing these vaccines to really LMIC, which is low and middle income countries or resource limited areas, whether they're in Bangladesh, India, South America, the African continent and so on and so forth. So how do we break this uh, cold chain issue to bring vaccine? And there are many other hurdles, but you kind of see that the delivery of these nucleic acid vaccines, which is kind of an amazing breakthrough in scientific achievement, where we can now, instead of giving small drugs, we are giving mRNA and DNA into the body. So that's kind of the, the delivery of these molecules inside the cell, and the cold chain is the kind of issue we're thinking about. And a few years ago, we like to play a lot with toys. And one of the things that, in my mind, was a toy is a barbecue lighter that we were looking at, trying to understand how a barbecue lighter works, because all of us have done a barbecue, and at home we might uh, light up a grill. And whenever you click it, you hear this clicking noise, and you see a spark, which basically mm -hmm. uh, breaks down the air, and you get a flame because you release some uh, volatile compound like butane stored in it. And the idea was, could we make an electroporator out of it? So the the broad view of an what electroporator. Is electro what? Electro electroporator. Okay. Yeah. Can you define so, that? What it is? Yeah. So, and it'll make sense in the context of DNA and mRNA vaccines mm. because we, when we need to put nucleic acids inside cells, if you inject DNA with just an injection into your uh, into your muscles or into your epidermis and your dermis, you realize the cells are not going to pick it up because it doesn't. Uh, get inside and through the cell plasma membrane to get it through the Pfizer and the Moderna. The, one of the innovations is to use a lipid nanoparticle because that is what is as the shuttle that allows this mRNA to actually get inside the cytoplasm where it can do its job. Same for DNA. You have to actually get it inside the cell if it has to act as a vaccine inside the cell or inside the nucleus. And one of the things besides lipid nanoparticles, which add all this whole chain issue, you can do electroporation. What it is is an instrument that applies a small uh, pulse of electricity. And because we know that in our body we have action potentials, we are basically living bodies with you know charges. If you apply a small charge, you can create small holes in your cell walls, which are reversible and will heal up. But those small holes can sneak in through DNA and mRNA. So you've basically gone through the barrier of being it outside the cell through the membrane inside where it can do its job. Now, these electrophoraders, in, for example, Inovio is a company that's making DNA vaccine in clinical trials phase two so far, are, can be bulky, complex, and are very, very complex. They're about $20,000 to make. And so we got inspired by this barbecue lighter. And we've invented a patch effectively inspired by this that you can essentially apply to your arms. And we've shown data in mice that allows us to put DNA inside the, uh, uh, this is SARS-CoV-2 vaccine and basically show high, very high efficacy without requiring any cold chain. So the vision is this, that, you know, in the future with this kind of technology, you would be able to provide DNA-based or mRNA-based vaccines without having to need cold chain storage. And then you would basically have a patch that you would apply and you could potentially self-administer it or very minimally trained rural health worker, maybe in the villages of India, could apply this and you don't have to worry about keeping it in a freezer. But the point is that a lot of this just started from understanding kind of the mechanics of these lighters and recognizing the aha moment that unlike complex circuits that would generate voltages, you could use a crystal, a piezoelectricity. So it's a little bit more, not soft matter, but hard matter. And you have a hammer and a spring and you can deform these crystals to release a charge, which in our vision allows us to put nucleic acids inside cells. Yeah, that is a fantastic discovery. And I hope uh, I hope to read that paper as well soon. Yeah, and I didn't tell you, but it's actually costs the whole thing costs one dollar, wow. and it can be used and thrown. So trying to again address the cost, and maybe you should ask yourself how much when you got the vaccine, how much does that actually cost, and you'll appreciate why we think about it as Google technology, um, because vaccines are still not affordable right yeah. now. It's subsidized, but probably not for the rest of the world. And also preparing for the future is always a better idea. Than, than, <laughs> than being sorry later. So, yeah, yeah that yeah. brings me to the last part of the questions. So let me ask you if you have any advices for the next generation scientists. I have uh, two things that I wish I had done earlier on is, number one, I 
always say this to myself and to my students, life is short. Um, oftentimes we do things because we think it looks good on paper or we're trying to strategize or think there's a strategic move for our careers. And I started to realize life is so short. We should always try to find the things that make us a better version of ourselves than trying to emulate somebody else like our mentors. It's just not worth it. And so the sooner we try to listen to our inner voices, and I was so happy the day I realized that I wanted to study spiders and I was able to have the courage to do it, and students the same. The sooner we realize, hey, I really think I like this, I want to do this. To say no to what we're doing and to do what we love is so easy advice, but so hard to do, but it makes life so meaningful and it's so less stressful. You can sleep at night uh, <laughs> if you can, if the idea doesn't keep you up at night. Um, and the second piece of advice then is to find people that you want to hang out with and brainstorm and you enjoy talking to, especially as your mentors, irrespective of whether they are at some seemingly per in, in one's perspective or somebody else's perspective is a strategic move because they're at a big university or small university. I think, again, those are things that perhaps matter, but what really personally matters is if you find somebody whose work you admire and enjoy, and you'd be like, oh my God, I would love it if I could just hang out with them and be able to do X, Y, or Z with their tools, techniques, and learn how to enjoy science. I think that's far more meaningful than trying to, uh, uh, trying to plan X manuscripts or this or that. Mm -hmm. I think all of those things come if you kind of follow and do what, what, you would like to do rather than trying to game it or trying to strategize too much, which sometimes I forget why we all do this and I'm guilty of the same. And uh, at some point I just stopped worrying about these things and kind of trying to just be myself. And I think uh, I've been so happy. So let me, I mean, this is, a, this is a point which I have been struggling with and I have friends who have been struggling with. So definitely you are, we are working on something which is very relevant or we think it's very extremely relevant, but how do you find you know how do you how do you transform yourself like this is what helps me in the strategic move or as a, as in terms of a career or versus how do you find what you like is there is there a tip for that i don't know how you find what you like uh, that's a harder one but i think sometimes most of us at early stages of careers definitely find what we don't like <laughs> that's sometimes how we do it's like oh my god i will never do more tech auto simulations uh -huh. i have nothing against more tech auto simulations <laughs> but sometimes we can find out some person will say oh my god i will never work with warm blobs okay no problem no harm no foul right i don't want to ever work with spiders great great at least you found something you don't like now let's find something you might be open to mm -hmm. and Oftentimes, we will have it. Like, I'm sure you are doing this whole radio podcast. Somewhere, some voice told you, hey, you know what? Wouldn't it be cool if I did this? Now, this is such a low energy thing, but not anybody else is doing it, but you are doing it. I'm sure hundreds of other students and postdocs had this idea, but you are actually putting, you know, your energy where your idea was and you're realizing, hey, this is actually much more meaningful and I don't know what career move this will help with, but do I care? No, it sounds like you're doing it just because it's a joy to share these stories with other people without having a bigger agenda. You just want to do it just because it's fun for you. And I think at the end of the day, we should try to find science. And I can say it, it's easy to say it, very hard to do it, but I'm trying to live what I'm saying is I do the science because I enjoy it. And that's far more important. I'll tell you a couple of months ago, we had to stop a project because I realized I no longer enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is now boring. Mm -hmm. Now, it might be important, but I find it boring and I never want to do things that I, life is too short again. So to be able to tell the student, let's shake hands and let's just say, let's put this in the drawer for now. There's no point in continuing and kicking a dead horse because somebody else may find better joy. But at this point in our lives in 2020, in the middle of pandemic, we couldn't care more about this anymore. But there's another thing we really, really want to think about right now. So sometimes doing these are hard things, but you have to do it because, again, you just have to find the things that keep the flame going of your curiosity. And it's it's just more magical that way, I think. And for how to find that, I think, is hard. And um, I think the pandemic in some ways perhaps eases this where we could all reach out to other people mm -hmm. and we're all trigger happy to do Zoom talks. So yeah. well, let's take advantage of it. Nobody <laughs> ever says no now. <laughs> yeah, I agree. So... I would like people say that bo boredom is the enemy of creativity, but I believe that it's the other way around because when mm -hmm. you know that you're bored, that's when you know you have to be more creative. So it's a, it's yeah. a to me, it's like a trigger of uh, uh, creativity boredom is. So 
which is good so the last point so is there anything that i had in asked and you would like to add in this um well one thing uh, which perhaps i should expli- explicitly say to mm-hmm. some of uh, your readers is that uh, to your listeners sorry i forgot this was a podcast this is new <laughs> to me <laughs> nobody's going to read this but listen to this is um you know um if you uh for one for uh, uh joining the lab obviously we are always looking to talk to people and learn more about see if it's compatible so if this sounds exciting reach out right that's my plug to say that we're always looking to hire more people but the second thing i will say uh and it has nothing to do with me but oftentimes we will read a paper and we'll be like oh my god that is so cool i love this figure or i love this and i think as a small gesture of kindness and engagement we can all do which i'm sure you will love if somebody ever emails you and said by the way i read your paper <laughs> and it was you know the best half an hour of my life and it was so cool because in science what else do we get we publish these papers we never get any money but to get an acknowledgement that hey this is cool i think as a gesture we could all do that and i think it would make uh, all of us happy so we should never hesitate from reaching out to folks and saying and i've started to do this myself but i'll send the first author and you know saying by the way i really enjoyed that good job and we can all do that um apart from other stuff in the so lab you, we could talk I, all I, day i suggesting that there should be a comment session on each paper No, I'm just, that, well, that's way too much. But I'm just suggesting, as a tiny act of gratitude, we sure. should never hesitate to let faculty or uh, authors know when we like their stuff, uh, because you know that's another way to engage and find something to talk about. When we read somebody's paper, we find it. It's always a delight, which we would all like for others to tell us when they read our paper. So. Um, Uh, that just comes to mind and i'm trying to think if there's anything else uh, that you should know oh one last thing this is just a fun aside if you mm-hmm. want to learn a little bit about the research we make our research into comics and you can check our website if you want to read about the research in comic form in m- many la- languages um including telugu and arabic and chi- uh, uh, in chinese so that would be fun for some Uh, yeah. for sharing with your younger siblings <laughs> definitely that that actually one one of the one of the Uh, the person which uh, appeared in the podcast Ma- Marlene Camperman she she does a lot of outreach and what she she has a comic going on in in um, i think it's i want to say dutch language but yeah mm-hmm. netherlands whatever language netherlands people people speak so well, she wanted to send me but then i was like okay this is a different language i don't <laughs> i don't understand but yeah definitely like i i i, I li- really like people who are trying to put effort to teach the younger generation how to do science so thank you so much for doing that and but more importantly yeah. in their language because you know why should if i were growing up and growing up i spoke hindi mm-hmm. wouldn't it be amazing if i learned about the science in my own language and of course english is fine now english is the main language but there's always a joy when we are in peru we talk to some of our some of the students there to be able to show them the work in spanish is mm-hmm. a extra joy that look we took the effort to convey to you the science in your own language to again break that barrier to enable and empower a broader diversity of scientists to be more welcoming to bring in people rather than create barriers does that make sense language yeah. can be a barrier yeah. and because science is always in english yeah because uh, when i started like i mean i studied i mean my mother tongue is malayalam so i started uh, my schooling in malayalam till until my 10th standard i studied everything in malayalam but now going back i mean i can read and write and speak very well but i don't it's very hard for me to communicate unless i put extra effort uh in science yeah. but i would really love to contribute in something of that sort the the only sentence you're making me channel my malayalam from my best friend back in the day is i the only sentence i know is independent <laughs> that's so good <laughs> <laughs> you still remember <laughs> yeah yeah that, that that means what's your name uh, for the folks yeah. know yeah that's nice yeah thank you awesome. so much for taking the time this was yeah. this was amazing keep doing this you're doing a great job and you should be very proud Thank you so much. That's it for today guys. I hope you all enjoyed this episode. Please find the show notes at the softmattershow.com for more details. That is T H E S O F T M A T T E R S H O W.com. You can write your questions, suggestions and everything else to me at amal narayanan at the softmattershow.com. See you with another exciting episode soon. Until then, Bye.